It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. However little known the feelings or views of such a man may be on his first entering the neighborhood, this truth is so well fixed in the minds of the surrounding families that he is considered as the rightful property of some one or other of their daughters. My dear Mr. Bennet, have you heard that Netherfield Park is let at last? I have not. But it is, for Lady Lucas has just told me all about it this morning. Do you not want to know who has taken it? You wish to tell me, and I have no objection to hearing it. Well, my dear, you must know, for Lady Lucas says that Netherfield is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England, that he came down on Monday in a chaise and four to see the place and was much delighted with it. What is his name? Bingley. Oh, is he uh, married or single? Oh, single, to be sure, my dear. Yeah. A single man of large fortune. Four or five thousand a year. What a fine thing for our girls. How so? How can it affect them? Oh, my dear Mr. Bennet, how can you be so tiresome? Surely you must know that I'm thinking of his marrying one of them. Oh, is that his design in settling here? <laughs> design nonsense. But it is very likely that he may fall in love with one of them. Mm. And therefore, you must visit him as soon as possible. I see no occasion for that. <gasps> you and the girls may go, or you may send them by themselves, which still may be better, for as you are as handsome as any of them, Mr. Bingley might like you the best of the party. <laughs> my dear, you flatter me. I certainly have had my share of beauty, but I don't pretend to be anything extraordinary now. When a woman has five grown-up daughters, she ought to give over thinking of her own beauty. Hmm. In such cases, a woman has not much beauty to think of. But, my dear, you must indeed go see Mr. Bingley. Oh, it is more than I engage to do, I assure you. Oh, but consider your daughters. Only think what an establishment it would be for one of them. Sir William and Lady Lucas are determined to go merely on that account, for you know in general they see no newcomers. Indeed, you must go, for it will be impossible for us to visit him if you do not. You are over-scrupulous, surely. I dare say Mr. Bingley would be very glad to see you. And I will send a few words by you to give him my hearty consent to marrying whichever he chooses of the girls. Though, so, I will throw in a good word for my little Lizzie. I desire you will do no such thing. Lizzie is not a bit better than the others. I'm sure hmm. she's not half so handsome as Jane nor half so good-humoured as Lydia, but you're always giving her the preference. Well, in this particular instance, my little Lizzie is the only one unprovided for. Lydia and Kitty belong in the schoolroom with Mary, and you've already told me that our Mr. Collins has already spoken for Jane. Oh, that odious Mr. Collins! I wish he had never come here. I wish I might never hear his name again. Mr. Collins odious? <laughs> you surprise me. I thought that he had finally gained your approval. Well, since he had to be your cousin, and since mm. you will do nothing about the entail, ah. I suppose it will be a mercy if he does marry Jane. Oh, I do think it's the hardest thing in the world that our estate should be taken from our daughters and given to your nearest male relation simply because we have no son of our own. Ah, it entails most iniquitous affair, but it is the law. <laughs> To say nothing of the fact that Mr. Collins doesn't even need our estate, having just been granted his, his fine and enviable position as rector in the parish of the Right Honourable Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Uh, well, nothing can clear Mr. Collins from his guilt in being my cousin, but he is doing all in his power to make amends by <clears throat> marrying one of our girls. Well, I suppose that is something. Something? With Jane so well provided for, and a man like Mr. Bingley at Netherfield Hall, well, uh, I should think that you would be absolutely delighted. Mr. Bingley? We shall never even know the man. Oh, how you take delight in vexing me. You have no compassion on my poor nerves. You mistake me, my dear. I have a high respect for your nerves. Oh. They are my, my old friends. I've heard you mention them with great consideration these 20 years. Ah, you do not know what I suffer. But I hope that you will get over it and see many a man of 4,000 a year come into the neighborhood. It will be of no use to us if, if 20 such should come, since you will not visit them. Depend upon it, my dear, that when there are 20...
I will visit them all. <laughs> oh, my fingers ache from that horrid practice. On the contrary, Kitty, I quite enjoy the hours spent at the pianoforte. Oh, Mary, then why don't you play while Kitty and I dance? Uh, Lydia, I'm tired to death. Are you unwell, Mama? Of course I am unwell. Your father cannot be persuaded to call on Mr. Bingley at Netherfield. So you girls shall never know the man. But, Mama, you forget that we shall meet the gentleman at the ladies' assembly in town. For Lady Lucas has promised to introduce us. I do not believe that Lady Lucas will do any such thing. She has a daughter of her own, you know. Where is that Charlotte? I believe she's out in the garden walking with Lizzie and... As Charlotte is not present, I shall say that Lady Lucas is a selfish, hypocritical woman and I have no opinion of her. Mm. Oh. <coughs> do stop coughing, Kitty, for heaven's sake. Have a little compassion on my nerves. Kitty has no discretion in her coughs. <sighs> She times them ill. I do not cough for my own amusement. Jane, when is the next ball to be? Tomorrow fortnight. Aye, so it is. And Lady Lucas does not return until the night before. So you see, Mr. Bennet, it will be quite impossible for her to introduce Mr. Bingley. Well, then you must take the advantage of your friend and introduce Mr. Bingley to her. Impossible, Mr. Bennet, when I'm not acquainted with the man myself. How can you be so teasing? Uh, I honor your circumspection. A fortnight's acquaintance is very little, but if we do not venture, then somebody else will, and if you decline the office, well, I would have to take it upon myself. Oh, nonsense, nonsense. Do you consider the forms of introduction and the stress that is laid upon them as nonsense? <laughs> well, I can't quite agree with you there. <clears throat> what say you, Mary? You are a woman of uh, deep reflection, I know, and... Read great books. I think it is Addison who said, good breeding shows itself most where... Oh, where? A good breeding shows itself most where... Where it where? appears... Well, well Mary is trying to adjust her ideas. Ah, let us return to Mr. Bingley. Oh, I am sick of Mr. Bingley. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But why did you not tell me so this morning? If I had known earlier, well, I certainly would not have called upon him. <gasps> what? You have called upon him? <gasps> it is very unlucky indeed. But uh, as I have paid him the visit, and he would more than likely return it at any time, and bring his friend, Mr. Darcy, with him. Well, I suppose that we cannot now avoid the acquaintance of Mr. Bingley and his party. Oh, Mr. Bennet, how good it was in you. I knew you loved your girls too well to neglect such an acquaintance. Mm. And it is such a good joke, too, that you should have known all this time that you've already paid him a visit and never said a word about it. <laughs> Kitty, you may cough as much as you choose. I'll be in the library. Mr. Bennet was so odd a mixture of quick parts, sarcastic humour, reserve and caprice, that the experience of three and twenty years had been insufficient to make his wife understand his character. Her mind was less difficult to develop. She was a woman of mean understanding, little information and uncertain temper, when she was discontented, she fancied herself nervous. The business of her life was to get her daughters married. Its solace was visiting and news. What an excellent father you have, girls! I do not know how you shall ever make him amends for his kindness, or me either for that matter. At our time of life, I can assure you it is not pleasant to be making acquaintance every day, but for your sakes we would do anything. Lydia, my love, though you are the youngest, I dare say that Mr. Bingley will dance with you at the next ball. <laughs> I am not afraid, Mama. For though I am the youngest, I am the tallest. <laughs> but Jane, where is Lizzie? As I was saying before, she's out in the garden walking with Charlotte and with Mr. Collins. Uh, Lizzie out walking with Mr. Collins? Why didn't you go, Jane? Well, as Charlotte was visiting, Lizzie agreed to walk with her. And I was accompanying my sisters at the pianoforte. I am sure they would have excused you. But, Mama, why is Mr. Collins here at all? Although he is Papa's cousin, he is such a bore. Oh, now, girls, I want you to be very civil to Mr. Collins while he is here. 
Especially you, Jane. I'm a ma. Yes, you, Jane. But why? No, not at all, Mr. Collins. Thank you. Quick, Charlotte, come in. <laughs> but, Lizzie, what have you done with Mr. Collins? Nothing, Mama. He's only gone round to the library. Oh, no doubt he's gone to find that book of sermons he read to us <laughs> yesterday. Uh, well, he needn't bother. I've hidden it. <laughs> <laughs> Lydia, that is hardly a kind way to treat our guest. <laughs> Nonsense! Mary, that he did us all a favour, for we all know how much Mr. Oh. Collins is. Um, Mr. Collins, there you are. Did you enjoy the garden? Uh, most assuredly, madam. <laughs> Although I did not find Mr. Bennett in the library just now. Uh, do you know where he is? Why, I cannot imagine, Mr. Collins. But, Lizzie, we did not tell you the good news. News, Mama. Yes, your father has just informed us that we may expect a visit at any time from our newest neighbour, Mr. Bingley, and a friend of his. Oh, well, Mr. Bingley, that would be quite entertaining. Don't you think so, Mr. Collins? Um, pardon me, uh, Miss Elizabeth. I was just looking for a volume of Four Dice's Sermons that uh, you remember. I was reading to you all yesterday. I did not find it in the library. Do you know where it is? I haven't seen it, Mr. Collins, but I will try to find it for you. No, no. Uh, Lydia will find the book. Lydia, oh. my love, see if you can find Mr. Collins' book of sermons. Mrs. Bennet, I am quite sure I saw that book in the hall. If you wish, I will go fetch it. On, on no account, Charlotte. One of my daughters can help. Uh, Lydia will find the book. <laughs> Mr. Collins, what do you think of meeting our new neighbours? If those neighbours are possessed of those qualifications which do redound to their own credit and to the edification of their friends. Otherwise, as rector of the parish of the Lady Catherine de Bourg, I must hesitate in my approval. You understand, madam, the extreme caution which should ever be exercised where my amiable young cousins are concerned. Nonsense, Mr. Collins. We have found out all about them. Mr. Darcy and Mr. Bingley are connected with some of the most respectable families in England. Uh, Mr. Darcy, did you say? Uh, Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy? He is none other than the nephew of my patroness, Lady Catherine de Burr. You know the man. It is true that I've not yet had the um, privilege of meeting the man, though he visits his aunt quite frequently, and she has promised on some occasion to bring him to inspect my humble parsonage. Mm. I think Lady Catherine would consent to this visit, uh, provided my fair young cousins keep in mind the proper attitude of respectful humility, um, which should ever be assumed toward a person of his superior station. We will promise, Mr. Collins, never for one instant to forget either Mr. Darcy's exalted position or our own insignificance. And that is as it should be, Miss Elizabeth. <clears throat> and now, madam, I must ask to be excused so that I might retire to the library. Mr. Collins was not a sensible man, and the deficiency of nature had been but little assisted by education or society. The respect which he felt for the Lady Catherine de Bourg, and his veneration for her as his patroness, mingling with a very good opinion of himself, of his authority as a clergyman, and his rights as a rector, made him altogether a mixture of pride and obsequiousness, self-importance, and humility. Miss Bennet, do you grasp in its full significance the fact that we may soon be honoured by a visit from Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy, nephew of Lady Catherine de Bourgh? <laughs> oh, Lizzie, Mr. Collins is a bit pompous, but he does seem a very well-meaning young man. Indeed, sometimes quite agreeable. Yes, no one can be anything but agreeable in your mind, dear Jane. Well, I think Mr. Bingley and Mr. Darcy promise well. If half of what the neighbours say is true, Mr. Bingley is sure to bring us all sorts of gaieties. <laughs> then, dear Jane, we shall be well provided for. For hospitality, Mr. Bingley, for grandeur, Mr. Darcy, and the agreeable Mr. Collins. <laughs> oh, Lizzie, can you not let the poor man alone? Yes, with all my heart, I will gladly let him alone. You shall have him all to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> to your young gentleman from Netherfield, miss. Show them in, please, and tell Mama. Mr. Bingley and Mr. Darcy shed a very steady friendship in spite of great opposition of character. Bingley was endeared to Darcy by the easiness, openness, ductility of his temper, though no disposition could offer greater contrast to Darcy. In understanding, 
Darcy was the superior. Bingley was by no means deficient, but Darcy was clever. He was at the same time haughty, reserved and fastidious, and his manners, though well-bred, were not inviting. Bingley was sure of being liked wherever he appeared, while Darcy was continually giving offence. Welcome to Longbourn, gentlemen! I am sorry to report that Mr. Bennet is out for his walk. Good morning to you, Mrs. Bennet. I'm your new neighbour at Netherfield. My name is Bingley. This gentleman is my friend, Mr. Darcy of Pendleton, Derbyshire. Oh, Mr. Bingley, Mr. Darcy, we are delighted to have you visit, to be sure. May I present my eldest daughter, Miss Bennet, and her nearest sister, Miss Elizabeth Bennet. You must be pleased with your new residence, Mr. Bingley. I do not know the place in the country equal to Netherfield. You will not think of quitting it in a hurry, I hope. Oh, whatever I do is done in a hurry. Oh. Therefore, if I should resolve to quit Netherfield, I should probably be off in five minutes. <laughs> At present, however, I consider myself as quite fixed there. <laughs> it is a pleasure to have Netherfield open once more. Though you both must miss London. There is so much gaiety in London. Yes. In the country, you move in a confined and unvarying society. Uh, but people themselves alter so much, there is something new to be observed in them forever. Well, then you are a studier of character, Miss Elizabeth. It must be an amusing study. Yes, and intricate characters are the most amusing. The country can supply but few subjects for such a study. Oh, I can assure you there is as much observation going on in the country as in town. <laughs> I cannot see that... London has any great advantage over the country for my part, except the shops and public places. The country is a vast deal pleasanter, is it not, Mr. Bingley? When I am in the country, I never wish to leave it. And when I am in town, it is pretty much the same. They, they have each their advantages, and I can be equally happy in either. Aye, that is because you have the right disposition. That gentleman over there seemed to think the country nothing at all. Oh, indeed, you are mistaken, Mama. He only meant that there were not such a variety of people to be met with in the country as in the town, which you must acknowledge to be true. Well, certainly, my dear, nobody said there were. But as for not meeting with many people, I know a few neighbourhoods larger. I know we dine with uh, four and twenty families. Would you like to see the garden, Mr. Bingley? Thank you, I would. Oh, yes, there is a fine view of... Uh, Sir William Lucas's place from here. He is our nearest neighbour, and he seems to quite enjoy the country. Come, Jane, let us show Mr. Bingley the garden. Won't you come too, Mr. Darcy? Thank you, no. I prefer people to places, like yourself, I dare say. That is not what I said. No, but I've drawn that conclusion. Well, I can laugh at people a good deal better than places, and I dearly love a good laugh. Isn't that a dangerous trait, Miss Bennet? The wisest and the best of men may be rendered ridiculous by a person whose first object in life is a joke. Certainly, but I hope I never ridicule what is wise or good. Whims and inconsistencies do divert me, I own, and I laugh at them whenever I can. For these, I suppose, are su precisely what you are without. Perhaps that is not possible for anyone. But it has been the study of my life to avoid those weaknesses which often expose a strong understanding to ridicule. And in your list of weaknesses, do you include such faults such as pride or vanity, for instance? Yes, vanity is a weakness indeed. But pride, where there is a real superiority of mind, pride will always be under good regulation. I'm perfectly convinced, Mr. Darcy, that you have no defects. I make no such pretension, Miss Bennet. I have faults enough. My temper I dare not vouch for. I cannot forget the follies and vices of others. My good opinion once lost is lost forever. That is a failing indeed. Implacable resentment is a shade in a character. But you have chosen your fault well. I really cannot laugh at it. You are safe from me. There is, I believe, in every disposition a tendency to some particular evil, a natural defect which not even the best education can overcome. And is your defect a propensity to hate everybody? <laughs> no more than yours, Miss Bennet, is to willfully misunderstand them. But you must give a ball at Netherfield, Mr. Bingley. Mama. Certainly, Mrs. Bennet. I had already decided upon it. I told Mr. Darcy just yesterday that as soon as my sister, Miss Bingley, had arrived and my cook could make white soup enough, that I should send out my cards. Did I not, Mr. Darcy? I believe you did. That is delightful news, Mr. Bingley. Then your friend might change his mind about the country. 
You did not join us in the garden, Mr. Darcy. I was admiring your daughter's handiwork, madam. Oh, you should see Jane's work. Lizzie is a reader like her father and takes pleasure in little else, but... Jane, show your embroidery to Mr. Bingley. And Mama, I am sure Mr. Bingley is not the least bit interested. Oh, on, on the contrary, Miss Bennet. Pray, show it to me. So you are a reader and take no pleasure in anything else? I deserve neither such praise nor such censure. I am not a great reader. I take pleasure in a great many things. So I should have thought. It is amazing to me to think how young ladies have the patience to be as accomplished as they are. To think, to think how you all paint tables and cover screens and net purses. It, it's quite wonderful. Do you agree with your friend, Mr. Darcy? His list of the common extent of accomplishments has much truth. But I cannot boast to knowing more than half a dozen young ladies and a whole range of my acquaintance that are really accomplished. Then you must comprehend a good deal in your idea of an accomplished woman. Perhaps. To deserve the word, a woman must have a thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, and the modern languages. She must also possess a certain something in her air and manner of walking, her tone of voice, her address and expression. And to all this, she must yet add something more substantial in the improvement of her mind by extensive reading. I am no longer surprised that you're knowing only six accomplished women, Mr. Darcy. I rather wonder that you know any. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, Miss Bennet, that we cannot stay to see Mr. Bennet. We, we are already late for another appointment. It was very wonderful to meet you. I hope we will meet again quite soon. It would be my pleasure, Miss Bennet. Miss Elizabeth, <clears throat> I have found by singular accident that there is in this room a near relation of my patroness, Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Will you present me? Mr. Bingley, may I present my cousin, Mr. Collins? Mr. Darcy, Mr. Collins. I trust you will pardon me for not having paid my respects before this moment. Uh, my total ignorance of your presence must plead my apology. I was not informed of it. <clears throat> Is there any message, sir, which I could bring from you to your aunt, my patroness, or to your fair cousin, Miss de Berg? Thank you. I will not trouble you so far. Oh, it should be no trouble, but an honor and a privilege. We are very late, Bingley. Yes, of course. Um, we have a moment to lose. Uh, good afternoon to you ladies, uh, Mr. Collins. Allow me to accompany you to your carriage. <laughs> oh, madam, what a privilege. Uh, Mr. Darcy was most condescending. You must have been impressed by his distinguished manners. Really, Mr. Collins, I was not at all impressed. Mrs. Bennet, this moment is most opportune. <laughs> Madam, <laughs> I hope to interest your fair daughter Jane in the matter on which we were speaking yesterday. I would like to solicit the honor of a private meeting with her this morning, if I may. Certainly, Mr. Collins. However, there have been some alterations in my plan since last we spoke. Some things have happened, and I think it's right you should know that Jane is very likely to be soon engaged. Uh, but there is Elizabeth, Mr. Collins. I cannot take it upon myself to say I cannot possibly answer, but I do not know of any prepossession in her case, and she could have no objection to listen to you. Then, Miss Elizabeth, let it be, madam. I was struck by her attitude of respectful awe when I mentioned the Lady Catherine. Such uh, modesty and humility of mind cannot but recommend her to my patroness. Yes, my daughter Elizabeth knows what is proper. Shall I call her now? I think, madam, there should be no further loss of time, as my leave of absence extends only to the coming Saturday. Jane, I want you upstairs. Lizzie, Mr. Collins has something he wishes to say to oh, you. Oh, Mama, Mr. Collins must excuse me. I was just going upstairs myself. Nonsense, Lizzie. I desire you stay and hear Mr. Collins out. Mama, he has something I... very particular to say to you. I insist I... you stay. Come, Jane. Mr. Collins.
Miss Elizabeth. <clears throat> Your modesty, uh, far from doing you any disservice, rather, adds to your other perfections. Uh, but allow me to assure you, I have your respected mother's permission for this address. <clears throat> you can hardly doubt my attentions to you have been too marked to be mistaken. I have singled you out as the companion of my future life. Uh, but before I run away with my feelings on the subject, perhaps it would be advisable for me to state my reasons for marrying. Mr. Collins, my reasons I... are, first, that I think it's right for any clergy in easy circumstance, like myself, uh, to set the example of matrimony in his parish. And second, <laughs> I'm convinced that it would grad greatly to my happiness. And third, which perhaps I should have mentioned earlier, that it is the particular advice and recommendation of the most esteemed lady whom I have the honor of calling a patroness. You must accept I my I can assure you that there are many amiable young women in my parish, but seeing as it is that I am to inherit this estate after the death of your esteemed father, who, however, may live a good many years longer, <clears throat> I could not satisfy myself without having chosen a wife from among his daughters that the loss to them might be as little as possible when the melancholy event should take place. This motive, my fair cousin, I flatter myself, will not sink me in your esteem. You must accept my and most humble... And now, nothing remains but to assure you in the most animated language of the violence of my affection. You are too hasty, sir. <laughs> you forget that I have made no answer. Let me do it now without further loss of time. Accept my thanks for the compliment you are paying to me. I am very sensible of the honor of your proposals, but it would be impossible for me to do otherwise than decline them. I am not ignorant that it is the usual practice of young ladies to reject the addresses of the man whom they secretly mean to accept when he first applies for their favor, and that the rejection may repeat itself for a second or even a third time. I am therefore by no means discouraged by what you have just said, and shall hope to lead you to the altar ere long. Upon my word, sir, your hope is rather an extraordinary one after my declaration. I, I do assure you that I am not one of those young ladies, if such young ladies there are, who are so daring as to risk their happiness at the chance of being asked a second time. I am perfectly serious in my refusal. When I do myself the honor of speaking with you next on this subject, I shall hope to receive a more favorable reply than the one you have now Indeed, given. Indeed, Mr. Collins, you puzzle me exceedingly. I, I know not how to express my refusal in such a way as to convince you of its being one. You must give me leave to flatter myself, my dear cousin, that your refusal of me is merely words, of course. As I must conclude, you are not serious in your rejection of me. I shall choose to attribute it to your desire of increasing my love by suspense as is the usual practice of elegant young females. Can I speak plainer? Do not consider me as an elegant female pretending to plague you, but as a rational creature speaking the truth from her heart. I thank you again for the honor of your proposals, but it would be impossible for me to accept my feelings in every respect for it. You are uniformly charming. And I am convinced that when sanctioned by the excellent authority of both your parents, my proposals will not fail of being made acceptable. <clears throat> Mr. Collins was not left long to the silent contemplation of his successful love, for Mrs. Bennet had dawdled about the vestibule to watch for the end of the conference. May I congratulate us both on the prospect of our success? I trust I have every reason to be satisfied that my cousin refused me. Refused you? Oh, I have no doubt that her response flows from... Uh, Genuine modesty and delicacy of character. Nonsense, Mr. Collins. You may depend upon it that Lizzie shall be brought to reason. I will speak to her directly. She is a foolish, headstrong girl and does not know her own interest, but I shall make her know it. Uh, pardon me, madam, uh, but if she really is headstrong and foolish, I know not whether she would altogether make a desirable wife for a man in my situation, uh, who naturally uh, seeks happiness in the marriage estate. <laughs> Uh, if she persists in her refusal of me, perhaps it would be best not to force her. <laughs> if given to such defects of temper, 
I doubt she could contribute much to my felicity. Sir, you quite misunderstand me. Lizzie is only headstrong in matters such as these. In everything else, she is as good-natured girl as ever lived. I shall go to Mr. Bennet. We will very soon settle with her. You may rest assured, uh, I will send you word. <laughs> Mr. Bennet! Mr. D there you are, Mr. Bennet. You are wanted immediately. We are all in an uproar. You must make Lizzie marry Mr. Collins, for she vows she will not have him, and if you do not make haste, Mr. Collins will change his mind and not have her. I have not the pleasure of understanding you. Of what are you talking? Of Lizzie and Mr. Collins. Lizzie vows she will not marry Mr. Collins, and Mr. Collins is beginning to say he will not marry Lizzie. Lizzie? I, I thought that your design was toward Jane. No, it is Lizzie now, Lizzie. Well, what am I to do about it? It seems a hopeless business. Speak to her yourself. Tell her you insist upon her marrying him. Come here, my child. This is an affair of great importance. Now, I have been informed that uh, Mr. Collins has, has made you an offer of marriage. Is this true? Yes, Papa, it is. Very well. Uh, and this offer of marriage you have refused? I have, sir. Oh, very well. We have come to the point. Now, your mother insists upon you accepting him. Uh, is this not true, Mrs. Bennet? Yes, or I shall never see her again. Oh, well, an unhappy alternative is before you, Elizabeth. From this day forward, forward, you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Now, your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. And I will never see you again if you do. Oh, Lizzie! The weeks passed in a lively manner with much coming and going between Longbourn and Netherfield. In addition, a charming young officer, Mr. Wickham, joined the regiment quartered in town. His appearance was greatly in his favor. He had all the best parts of beauty, a fine countenance, a good figure, and very pleasing address. His charming company was enjoyed by all the Bennet sisters. Denny, can't you swing me any higher? You will soon sail off into the clouds, Miss Mr. Lydia. Mr. Pratt, swing me higher. Higher than Lydia. Let's make it a race. Now, now, Miss Kitty. No, Teddy, don't oh. let them win. Higher still. Lizzie, make Mr. Wickham come swing me too. Lydia, oh. Mr. Wickham has no intention of swinging you. Oh. <laughs> Lizzie, look, it's Mr. Bingley and Mr. Darcy. Oh. Good afternoon to you, Miss Bennet. Uh, and to all the Misses Bennet. Good afternoon, Mr. Bingley, Mr. Darcy. These are our friends. They are officers stationed at Meryton. Mr. Denny, Mr. Pratt. And the newest arrival to the militia, Mr. Wickham. Darcy, oh. you must excuse us, ladies. We have another engagement, but we, we, we had to stop on our way. It was a pleasure to see you. The pleasure was all mine. <clears throat> Mr. Bingley, have you quite forgotten your promise? M my promise? <gasps> to give a ball. It will be the most shameful thing in the world if you do not keep your word. I, I assure you, I'm, I'm quite ready to keep my engagement. And, and you shall, if you please, name the very day. Oh, Jane! Simply name the day and it shall stand. <clears throat> Saturday. Saturday it is then. Um, Miss Bennet, do you enjoy dancing? I do indeed, sir. Splendid. Uh, good day to you all then. <gasps> Come, Kitty, we must run and tell Mama. Goodbye, Mr. Denny. Goodbye all. Good afternoon, Mr. Denny, Mr. Pratt, and Mr. Wickham. Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy. Yes. He is staying with Mr. and Miss Bingley at Netherfield. You know the man? I do. Are you well acquainted with him? As much as I ever wish to be. I've spent very little time with him, but I find him very disagreeable. I have no right to give my opinion as to his being agreeable or otherwise. I'm not qualified to form one. I've known him too long and too well to be a fair judge. He is not at all liked in these regions. Everyone is disgusted with his pride. You will not find him more favorably spoken of by anyone. I cannot pretend to be sorry that, that he or that any man shall not be estimated beyond the deserts, but with him I believe the world is blinded by his fortune and consequence, or, or frightened by his high and imposing manners, <laughs> and sees him only as he chooses to be seen. How do you know him? We are, we are not on friendly terms, and it always gives me pain to meet him. His father, Miss Bennet, the late Mr. Darcy, 
was one of the best men that ever breathed, the truest friend I ever had. And I can never be in company with this Mr. Darcy without being grieved to the soul by a thousand tender recollections. His behavior to myself has been scandalous, but I verily believe I could forgive him anything and everything rather than his disappointing the hopes and disgracing the memory of his father. My father was steward to the late Mr. Darcy. The late Mr. Darcy was my godfather and excessively attached to me. He bequeathed me a fair living in his will. I can never do justice to his kindness. He meant to provide for me amply and thought he had done it, but, but when the living fell, it was given elsewhere by Darcy. But how could that be? How could his will be disregarded? Why, why did you not seek legal redress? There was just such an informality in the terms of the bequest as to give me no hope from law. A man of honor could not have doubted the intention, but Mr. Darcy chose to doubt it, or to treat it as a merely conditional recommendation, and to assert that I had forfeited all claim to it by extravagance and prudence, in short, anything or nothing. Certain it is that the living became vacant two years ago, exactly as I was of an age to hold it, and that it was given to another man. And no less certain it is that I cannot accuse myself of having really done anything to deserve to lose it. I have a warm, unguarded temper. I may perhaps have sometimes spoken my opinion of him, and to him too freely. I can recall nothing worse. The fact is that we are very different sort of men, and that he hates me. This is quite shocking. He, he deserves to be publicly disgraced. Some time or other, he will be. But it shall not be done by me. Till I can forget his father, I can never defy or expose him. Lizzie, it's time for dinner. Oh. Oh, I hope to see you again soon, Mr. Wickham. And I you, Miss Ben. The prospect of the Netherfield Ball was extremely agreeable to every female of the Bennet family. Mrs. Bennet chose to consider it as given in compliment to her eldest daughter and was particularly flattered by receiving the invitation from Mr. Bingley himself instead of a ceremonious card. Jane pictured to herself a happy evening in the society of Mr. Bingley and Elizabeth thought with pleasure of dancing a great deal with Mr. Wickham and of seeing a confirmation of everything in Mr. Darcy's looks and behaviour. The happiness anticipated by Kitty and Lydia depended less on any particular person, for though they each, like Elizabeth, meant to dance half the evening with Mr. Wickham, he was by no means the only officer who could satisfy them, and a ball was at any rate a ball, and even Mary could assure her family that she had no disinclination for it. While I can have my mornings to myself, it is enough. I think it's no sacrifice to join occasionally in evening engagements. Society has claims on us all, and I profess myself one of those who consider intervals of recreation and amusement as desirable for everybody. If there had not been a Netherfield ball to prepare for and talk of, the younger Mrs. Bennets would have been in a pitiable state at this time. For from the day of the invitation to the day of the ball, there was such a succession of rain as prevented their walking to visit the regiment even once, Nothing less than a dance on Saturday could have made such a week endurable. Hmm. Oh, uh, uh, a bit more to the left. There, that, that'll do quite nicely. Um, you may go and announce the guests as they arrive. Yes, sir. Oh. Well, what do you think of the arrangements for the ball, Darcy? Well, I have no criticism for the arrangements. But the ball, yes, I know you object. But I was obliged to follow through once the youngest Miss Bennet reminded me. Oh, come, Darcy, set your mind at ease. I'm going back to London as you suggest. Although I must, I must confess, I see no necessity for leaving so soon. I think you exaggerate the effect of my attentions toward the eldest Miss Bennet. Perhaps. And perhaps it is another Miss Bennet you wish to flee. I have eyes too, Darcy. What do you suggest? I've seen you admire the wit and vivacity of Miss... Elizabeth Bennet. She is indeed charming. <laughs> and I admit that were it not for the inferiority of her connections, I could be in some danger. But those family connections form an insurmountable barrier against any possible peril. At any rate, we shall be gone soon enough. Darcy, do you really think you should remain silent on the subject of Wickham? Decidedly. 
I do not choose to lay my private affairs before the world. But the fellow's sailing under false colors. You do not know what the result mo may be. I'm truly concerned at the foothold he has already gained in the Bennett family. What he failed to accomplish once, he may succeed at again, and these young ladies have no brother to defend them. Neither have they the wealth of Pemberley to excite Mr. Wickham's greed. At any rate, I do not wish to be the one to enlighten the neighborhood. Ah, there you are, brother. Charlie. The carriages are arriving. Mr. Darcy, would you fasten this for me? Very well. My dear brother, I have an excessive regard for Jane Bennett. She's really a very nice girl, and I wish with all my heart that you were well settled. But with such a father and mother and such low connections, I'm afraid there's no chance of it. Caroline, did I hear you say that they have an uncle who is an attorney in Meryton? Yes, and they have another one who lives somewhere near Cheapside. <laughs> oh, if they had uncles enough to fill all Cheapside, it would not make them one jot less agreeable. No, no, but it must very materially lessen their chance of marrying men of any consideration in the world. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. Miss Bennett. Miss Bennett. Miss Bennett. Miss Bennett. <laughs> and Miss Bennett. Until Elizabeth entered the drawing room at Netherfield and looked in vain for Mr. Wickham, a doubt of his being present had never occurred to her. She had dressed with more than usual care and prepared in the highest spirits for the conquest of all that remained unsubdued of his heart. A good evening to you, Miss Lydia Bennett. But where is Mr. Wickham? Oh, well, he was obliged to go to town on business and hasn't returned. But I do not imagine his business would have called him away just now had a certain gentleman not been here. So sharp was her disappointment that Elizabeth could hardly contain herself within the bounds of tolerable civility. But Elizabeth was not formed for ill humor, and though every prospect of her own was destroyed for the evening, it could not long dwell upon her spirit. She soon told all her grief to Charlotte Lucas, whom she had not seen for a week. I dare say you will find Mr. Darcy very agreeable. <laughs> that would be a great misfortune to find a man agreeable whom one is so determined to hate. Do not wish me such an evil. <laughs> you are angry because Wickham is not here, but I wouldn't allow my fancy for him to make me unpleasant in the eyes of a man of ten times his consequence. My fancy for Wickham is simply sympathy for a most ill-used man. Perhaps. <laughs> now, Eliza, I must tell you something. What is it, Charlotte? You must be the first to hear the news. <laughs> what? I don't know how to put it, but to come right out with it. I am engaged! Uh, Charlotte! To <laughs> Mr. Collins! Charlotte! Engaged to Mr. Collins? Oh, that's impossible. What? Why should you be so surprised, my dearest Eliza? Do you think it's incredible that Mr. Collins should be able to procure any woman's good opinion? Because he has not been so happy as to succeed with you. I think we're being treated more than Lizzie. Without Mr. Wickham here, there are too few dance partners. Come, Mr. Denny, or we shall miss the reel. Oh, I believe this reel is half over now. Now you know I truly love a reel. We must hurry or we shall miss it. <laughs> yes, Miss Lydia. Charlotte, I can only say that I, I wish you every imaginable happiness. I see what you are feeling. You must be surprised, so lately Mr. Collins was wishing to marry you. But when you've had time to think it over, I hope you'll be satisfied with what I have done. I am not romantic, you know. I never was. I ask only a comfortable home. And considering Mr. Collins's character and connections and situation in life, I am convinced that my chance of happiness with him is as fair as most people can boast upon entering into the married state. Undoubtedly, you will come to visit me sometimes. I could not bear to lose you, Eliza. Of course, Charlotte, we are to be cousins, you know. <laughs> yes. cousins. I believe I am to have the honor of this dance, Miss Lucas. Yes, Colonel Forsyth.
not you feel a great inclination, Miss Bennett, to dance the reel? Do not you enjoy the reel, Miss Bennett? I heard you before, but I cannot immediately determine what to say in reply. You wanted me to say yes, that you might have the pleasure to despise my taste. But I always delight in overthrowing that kind of scheme. I have therefore made up my mind to say I do not want to dance the reel at all. And now despise me if you dare. I do not dare. I can guess the subject of your reverie. I should imagine not. You are considering how insufferable it would be to pass many evenings in such society. Indeed, I am quite of your opinion. I was never more annoyed. The insipidity, and yet the noise, the nothingness, and yet the self-importance of these people. What would I give to hear your strictures on them? May I have the honor of this next dance, Miss Bennett? Thank you, Colonel Forster, but I do not dance the reel. Oh, the reel is over. This is our dance. Oh. I assure you, your conjecture is totally wrong. My mind was more agreeably engaged. I was meditating in very great pleasure which a pair of fine eyes in the face of a pretty woman, woman can bestow. Indeed. And will you not tell me what lady has the credit of inspiring such reflections? Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Oh, Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Why, I am all astonishment. How long has she been such a favorite? Pray, when am I to wish you joy? That is exactly the question which I expected you to ask. A lady's imagination is very rapid. It moves from admiration to love, from love to matrimony in a moment. I knew you would be wishing me joy. Nay, if you are so serious, I shall consider the matters absolutely settled. You will have a charming mother-in-law. Of course, she will always be at Pemberley with you. Perhaps you might give her a few hints as to the advantage of holding her tongue. And, if you can compass it, do cure the younger girls of running after the other officers. And if I may mention so delicate a subject, endeavor to check that little something bordering on conceit and impertinence which your lady possesses. Have you anything else to propose for my domestic felicity? Yes. Do let the portrait of your new relation, the Meriton attorney, be placed in the gallery of Pemberley. Put it next to your great uncle, the judge. They are of the same profession, you know. As for your Elizabeth's picture, you must not attempt to have it taken. For a painter could do justice to those beautiful eyes. It would not be easy, indeed, to catch their expression. But their shape, and color, eyelashes, so remarkably fine, might be copied. <laughs> oh, I fear not. Darcy, I can't bear to see you standing about in this stupid manner. Come, let me find you a partner. Thank you, I have a partner. <laughs> oh, my dear Miss Bennett, you must be tired. I propose we sit quietly for this next dance. Do you agree? Yes, indeed. How very pleasant that you have arranged the rooms, Mr. Bingley. I'm glad you think so. I was afraid they'd be rather inconvenient for so large a party. Oh, I find them delightful. <laughs> You are always charitable, Miss Bennet. It seems to me that you always manage to see the best side of everything. I've never known you to say an ill word about a person or a place. Oh, I fear that is not quite exact. I only try to see things in their best light, perhaps. That's just it. The rest of us rarely try to see things in that manner. So you see, I've proved my case. You are too amiable. Not for tonight, Mr. Bingley. Everybody is of one mind tonight. There is but one point of view. You give nothing but pleasure. <laughs> I wish it were so. My dear Miss Bennet, I... I wish to tell you... I must tell you that tonight, I... It is your turn to say something now, Mr. Darcy. I talked about the dance. You ought to make some kind of remark about the size of rooms or the number of couples. I assure you, I will say whatever you wish. Very well, that reply will do at present. Perhaps by and by I might observe that private balls are much pleasanter than public ones. Do you talk by rule, then? Sometimes. One must speak a little, you know, and yet for the advantage of some, the conversation ought to be so arranged that they may have the trouble of saying as little as possible. Are you consulting your own feelings in the present case, or do you imagine you are gratifying mine? Both. For I have always seen a great similarity in the turn of our minds. We are each of an unsocial, taciturn disposition, Unwilling to speak unless we expect to say something that will amaze the whole room and be handed down to posterity with all the eclat of a proverb. This is no striking resemblance of your own character, I'm sure. 
How near it may be to mine, I cannot pretend to say. You think it a faithful portrait, undoubtedly. I shall not decide on my own performance. I am surprised not to see Mr. Wickham here tonight. He's a great favorite among the officers. He has many friends among them. Mr. Wickham is blessed with such happy manners as may ensure his making friends. Whether or not he is equally capable of retaining them is less certain. He has been so unfortunate as to lose your friendship, and in a manner which he is likely to suffer from all his life. What a charming amusement this dancing is for young people, Mr. Darcy. I do consider it to be one of the first refinements of polished society. Certainly, sir. And it has the advantage of being in vogue amongst the less polished societies of the world as well. Every savage can dance. Do you dance often at Pemberley? Never, sir. You have a house in London, I conclude. Oh, I thought of settling in town myself once, but did not think the air of London would agree with Lady Lucas. <clears throat> Mr. Bingley would like me to announce that the next dance will be on the terrace. <laughs> the interruption has made me forget what, what we were speaking of. I do not think we were speaking at all. Uh, Mr. Darcy, Charles wishes to speak with you about some of the seating arrangements. I believe you'll find him in the dining parlor. That is, if Miss Bennet will permit you. Certainly. So, Miss Bennet, I hear that you are quite delighted with George Wickham. He must have told you a pretty tale. As to Mr. Wickham using Mr. Darcy ill, it is perfectly false. I do not know the particulars, but I do know that Mr. Darcy has used him, and Mr. Wickham has used Mr. Darcy in a most infamous manner. His coming into the country at all is really a most insolent thing. I feel most strongly on this point, Miss Bennet, as Mr. Darcy's interests are so intimately associated with our own. We hope that Miss Georgiana Darcy may someday be my sister. My brother admires her greatly. Oh. Therefore, we resent these falsehoods and presumptions on the part of George Wickham. <laughs> but really, considering his descent, one could not expect much better. He has evidently forgotten to tell you that he is the son of old Mr. Wickham, steward to the late Mr. Darcy. His guilt and his descent appear by your account to be the same. I have heard you accuse him of nothing worse than being the son of Mr. Darcy's steward, and that, I assure you, he told me himself. Oh, I beg your pardon. Excuse my interference. It was kindly meant. Insolent girl. Lady Lucas, it is very hard for a lively young girl like my Lydia to be cooped up in a place where there is so little going on. But we shall not have it so very dull in the future. You know what I mean? Jane and Bingley! Ah, indeed. Yes, it is quite settled. Oh, such a charming young man, and Netherfield only three miles from Longbourn. And Jane's marrying will be a fine thing for my other girls. They will be sure to meet other rich young men and fall in love with them. Mama, be careful. Mr. Darcy can hear you. <laughs> What is Mr. Darcy to me, pray, that I should be afraid of him? I am certain we owe him no such particular civility as to be obliged to say nothing he might not like to hear. For heaven's sake, Mama, speak lower. What advantage can it be for you to offend Mr. Darcy? You will never recommend yourself to his friend by so doing. That is enough, Lizzie. I think I can take care of myself. I never knew before that it was a crime to speak to one's friends about what everybody can see plainly who has eyes in his head. Did you, Sir William? <clears throat> I had uh, sometimes expected you to notice what has been going on in our household as of late. What's going on? What has been going on? Why, only this, Mrs. Bennet, that Lady Lucas and myself must ask your great congratulations on our very great satisfaction of the recent engagement of our daughter Charlotte. <gasps> Charlotte engaged? Yes. Why, who in the world is going to marry her? The gentleman who my daughter is going to marry is your husband's cousin, Mr. Collins. Oh, Mr. Collins! <laughs> marry your Charlotte! Oh. oh, Lady Lucas, how can you tell such tales? Do you not know that Mr. Collins is going to marry my Lizzie or one of my other girls? Well, really, Mrs. Bennet! What I have told you is quite true, nevertheless, Mrs. Bennet. The whole matter is settled, and Mr. Collins has returned to Huntsford. 
I'm sorry we are not to receive your good wishes. Oh, but you are, Sir William. Charlotte has already told me of her engagement. We shall be most happy to welcome her as a cousin. Well, thank you, Miss Elizabeth. I'm sure other congratulations will shortly be in order. So Charlotte has told you, has she? I don't believe a word of it. Mama. I think that Mr. Collins has been taken in. Mama. I trust they will never be happy together, and I hope the match will be broken off. Mama, how And you, you are the cause of all this mischief, mischief, Lizzie. I think I have been barbarously used by you all. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please. <clears throat> I should like to propose the health of Mr. Bingley. Oh, Mr. Mr. Bingley. Bingley. May the pleasure which has given us all here tonight be but a foretaste of the future happiness which he will both give and receive in our present community. Oh, yes. Mr. Mr. Bingley, Bingley. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> To the master of Netherfield, may he retain that title from current fortunate youth to future green and honored old age. Oh, here, here. Mr. Bingley. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, I... I cannot tell you how touched I am by the kind words of Colonel Forster and Sir William Lucas. I only wish that I deserved them. <laughs> no, 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 I, I do not. I do not like to speak of such a painful subject on an occasion like this. And so I've told no one that I am about to leave Netherfield. Not, yes, it, it was a rather sudden decision, but more important interests have made it necessary for me to leave Netherfield. But only for a time, Mr. Bingley. Let us hope it will only be a temporary separation. Yes, why, well, certainly shall return very soon indeed. No, I'm afraid, I'm afraid my returning at all is extremely uncertain. I intend to leave Netherfield permanently. Oh, my oh, dear no, Mr. Sir. Bingley. What is to become of my poor child? But, but my friends, my friends, we, we never know what may happen. We shall all meet again sometime, and in the meantime, you must not let what I've said spoil your pleasure here tonight. There is still music. We, we must have another dance together. L let us set it up right here. I'm sure there should be room. A fine idea from our gracious host. Yes, a fine idea. Do you not think so, Mr. Darcy? May I have this dance, Miss Bingley? Yes. Miss Bennett. Will you give me the honor of a dance with you? The final happiness of my stay at Netherfield? May I have the honor, Miss Elizabeth? Thank you, Mr. Darcy, but I'm indisposed at present. farewell. But it's too ugly. Well, I do not think it's very pretty, but I thought I might as well buy it as not. I shall pull it to pieces as soon as possible, see if I can make it up any better. <laughs> but it really is too ugly. Well, there were two or three much uglier in the shop. And besides, when I've bought some prettier colored satin to trim it with fresh, I believe it will be very tolerable. Besides, it will not much signify what one wears this summer after Mr. Denny, Mr. Pratt, and of course, Mr. Wickham have left Meryton. Do they go today? Don't be such a stick, Mary. Cannot you hear the drums? And they are to be encamped near Brighton. Oh, I do so wish Papa would take us all there for the summer. It would be such a delicious scheme. And I dare say it would hardly cost anything at all. And Mama would like to go too, of all things. Only think what a miserable summer else we shall have. Far be it from me, my dear sister, to depreciate such pleasures. Sea bathing would doubtless be congenial with the generality of female minds, but I confess it holds no charms for me. I should infinitely prefer a book. Good heaven, 
What is to become of us, Lydia, my love? What are we to do when they are gone? I suppose that we shall go back to the quiet life at Longbourn. Oh, I'm sure I cried for two days together 25 years ago. I was a girl and Colonel Miller's regiment went away. I thought I should have broke my heart. I'm sure I shall break mine. If one could but go to Brighton. Oh, yes, if one could. Did I hear you, Miss Bennet, wish to go with us to Brighton? Oh, yes, but Papa will never hear of our going. <laughs> Perhaps this will alter his mind. Ah. What is in the letter? Mrs. Forster has grown so fond of your youngest daughter that she has invited her for a visit. Uh, once we are established, of course. <laughs> Lydia is to go alone. I am sorry, but that is the invitation. Farewell to you all. Goodbye. Well, I cannot see why Mrs. Forster should not invite me as well as Lydia. Though I am not her particular friend, I have just as much right to be asked as she has. And more too, for I am two years older. Now, Kitty, be happy for your sister. Lydia, my love! <laughs> Papa, Lydia will never be easy till she has exposed herself in some public place or other. Jane, you're soon to join your aunt in London. And there will be no peace at Longbourn if Lydia does not go to Brighton. Let her go, then. Colonel Forster is a sensible man and will keep her out of any real mischief. And luckily, she's too poor to be an object of prey to anybody. At Brighton, she'll be considered of less importance, uh, even as a common flirt than she is here. The officers will find women better worth their notice. Let us hope, therefore, that this will, that this will teach her her own insignificance. At any rate, she cannot grow many degrees worse without authorizing us to lock her up for the rest of her life. If Lizzie were here, Papa, I am certain she would prevail upon you. Oh, do not make yourself uneasy, Jane. Wherever you and Lizzie are known, you are to be respected and valued. And it will not appear too less advantage of having a couple of a... <coughs> or should I say three... That is silly sisters. In Lydia's imagination, a visit to Brighton comprised every possibility of earthly happiness. Meanwhile, Jane went to London to visit her aunt and uncle, the gardeners. Then in March, Elizabeth travelled to Huntsford. Soon after the carriage left the high road for the lane to Huntsford, the parsonage was discernible, along with a garden sloping down to the road. At length, Mr. Collins and Charlotte appeared. Welcome, welcome, my dear cousin Elizabeth. Yes, you are welcome indeed, my dearest Eliza. Oh, it is good to see you, Charlotte. And Mr. Collins, my greetings to you from all at Longbourn. Oh, yes, so very good to see you. <laughs> now, if you cast your eyes in this direction, you shall encounter our best view of the fair prospect of Rosings. Home of my patroness, Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Yes, it is very handsome indeed. Uh, and you shall also note that we enjoy uh, four fields to the east, seven fields to the west. And do you see that distant clump of trees? Yes. There are 27 trees in that clump. And beyond it, another 13 fields to the south. <laughs> is that not well indeed? But we must allow Mr. Lincoln to And you shall also note the uh, hedge on either side of the lane. I trimmed that myself. <laughs> I dare say you shall not see such a laurel hedge at Longbourn. No, indeed, I shall not. <laughs> and now we must show you every room in our humble abode. And I doubt not that Lady Catherine herself will grace us with an invitation before you are here <laughs> a week. Very few days passed in which Mr. Collins did not walk to Rosings. So it was on the following morning that he discovered the new arrival of two nephews of Lady Catherine, Mr. Darcy and a Colonel Fitzwilliam. To the great surprise of Elizabeth, when Mr. Collins returned, the gentleman accompanied him. Mr. Darcy paid his compliments with his usual reserve. Good day to you, Miss Bennet. Is your family well? My eldest sister has been in town these three months. Have you never seen her there? I've not been so fortunate as to meet with the eldest Miss Bennet, I'm sorry to say. Good day to you, then. Colonel Fitzwilliam was about 30, not handsome, but in person and address, most truly a gentleman. He entered into conversation directly with the readiness and ease of a well-bred man and talked very pleasantly. I'm sorry to say that Mr. Darcy is often very blunt in his arrivals and departures. 
In fact, we had to leave Rosings within the week. With such a short visit. Yes, if Darcy doesn't put it off. I'm at his disposal, you know. He arranges the business as he pleases. <laughs> I do not think I know anybody who seems more to enjoy the power of doing what he pleases than Mr. Darcy. Yes, he likes to have his own way very well, but so do we all. It is I only that he has a better means of having it than many others. I imagine your cousin brought you down with him chiefly for the sake of being at his disposal. I rather wonder that he does not marry and secure a lasting convenience of that kind. Perhaps his sister does as well for the present. And what sort of girl is Miss Darcy? She is 17, handsome, highly accomplished, in short, a very pleasing young lady. I am joined with him in the guardianship of Georgiana. Are you indeed? And pray, what sort of guardian do you make? Does your charge give you much trouble? Young ladies of her age are sometimes difficult to manage. Do you suppose Miss Darcy is likely to give us any uneasiness, Miss Bennet? If she has the true Darcy spirit, she may like to have her own way as she well. She is as amiable as any girl her age might be. Indeed. Well, she is a great favorite of a lady of my acquaintance, Miss Bingley. Yes, I know her a little. Her brother is a pleasant gentleman-like man, a great friend of Darcy's. Yes, Mr. Darcy takes a prodigious deal of care of him. I believe he does. From something he has told me, I have reason to think that Bingley was very much indebted to him. But I ought to beg his pardon, for I have no right to suppose that Bingley was the person that he meant. What is it you mean? It is a circumstance which, of course, Darcy could not wish to be generally known. For if it were to get round to the lady's family, it would be an unpleasant thing. You may depend upon my not mentioning it. And remember that I haven't much reason for suspecting it to be Bingley. <laughs> what he told me was merely this that he congratulated himself on having very lately saved a friend from the inconveniences of a most imprudent marriage. But without names or particulars, I only suspected it to be Bingley. Did, did Darcy give you the reasons for this interference? I, I understood that there were some strong objections against the lady. Indeed. What arts did he use to separate them? You're disposed then to think his interference officious? I do not see what right Mr. Darcy had to decide on the propriety of his friend's inclination. Why, on his judgment alone, Mr. Darcy was to determine in what manner his friend was to be happy. But as we know none of the particulars, it is not fair to condemn him. It is not to be supposed that there was much affection in the case. That is not an unnatural surmise, and I believe that Darcy told me that he did not think that the lady, at least, was very deeply concerned in the matter. However, to lessen the affection on either side is to lessen the honor of my cousin's triumph. Your cousin's triumph is not Herbert exactly... William, will you join us for tea? I had best catch up with Mr. Darcy for a walk this morning, if Miss Collins and Miss Bennet would pardon me this hasty call. Certainly, sir. Good day. Now, Eliza, we must get to our work and have a comfortable chat. You have been here nearly two weeks. We haven't had a good talk yet. Yes. We seem to get interrupted with regularity, Charlotte. You promised me a quiet visit, but I find you are more lively here than we are at Longbourn. How could I have anticipated the arrival here of two such promising young gentlemen? Ah, but there have been other interruptions to our talks. Oh, a very charming domestic picture. <clears throat> My dear, I found some very fine early radishes. I thought it would be a graceful attention on your part to send some of these to Miss de Berg. I fear the apothecary might object. True, but they are very fine radishes. Uh, Miss Elizabeth, I am quite successful in my gardening. I consider the work I do in my garden to be one of my most respectable pleasures. Uh, Lady Catherine is always ready to encourage me in it. And my dear Charlotte is ever willing that I should leave her side for the sake of this healthful exercise. <laughs> it is a pity that Mr. Berg is not well enough to enjoy them. Uh, Miss Elizabeth, my dear Charlotte, has doubtless told you of the alliance which is in prospect between Mr. Berg and Mr. Darcy. Yes, Charlotte has told me that she is sickly. She will make Mr. Darcy a proper wife. <laughs> I hope you're pleased with Kent, Miss Elizabeth. Very much so, Mr. Collins. I do not think the kingdom can boast a grander scene than the one now spread before our eyes. This garden, that park with rosings in the distance. I do not think that my dear Charlotte is most fortunately placed. Most fortunately, Mr. Collins. And when you've seen the Lady Catherine, you'll be more deeply impressed, I am sure. Of course, we can hardly expect her to call upon you. The illness of Mr. Berg would prevent it. And in any case, it would be an act of extreme condescension on her part. 
although I am quite confident you will receive an invitation to drink tea of a Sunday evening, uh, once Mr. Darcy and his cousin are gone, of course. <laughs> and we may later receive an invitation to dinner, <laughs> although I would not for the world arouse in you false hopes which may then be shattered. <laughs> For the moment, I shall leave you two ladies while I see if I can discover a few more radishes for this evening. Thank you. That would be lovely. Good evening, then, ladies. It was not till Easter Day, almost a week after the gentleman's arrival, that an invitation from Lady Catherine was offered. It was accepted, of course, and at the proper hour, they joined the party in Lady Catherine's drawing room. Her ladyship received them civilly, but it was plain that the company was by no means so acceptable as when she could get nobody else. What are you saying, Fitzwilliam? What is it you are talking of? What are you telling Miss Bennet? Let me hear what it is. We are speaking of music, madam. Oh, music? Then pray speak aloud. It is of all subjects my delight. I must have my share in the conversation if you are talking of music. There are few people in England, I suppose, with more true enjoyment of music than myself, or better natural taste. If I'd ever learnt, I should have been a great proficient. So would Anne, if her health had allowed her to apply. I am confident, I am confident that she would have been a delightful performer. How does Georgiana get on, Darcy? She is quite accomplished. I'm very glad to hear such a good account of her, but, but do tell her from me that she cannot expect to excel if she does not practice a good deal. I assure you, madam, she does not need such advice. She practices almost constantly. So much the better. It cannot be done too much. Miss Bennet, do you play? I do, madam. Very well. Play, then. You will never play really well unless you practice more. I assure you that though Mr. Collins has no instrument, you are welcome to come to Rosings every day and play on the pianoforte. You'd be in nobody's way, you know, in this part of the house. You mean to frighten me, Mr. Darcy, by coming in all this state to hear me. I will not be alarmed, though your sister does play so well. There is a stubbornness about me that can never bear to be frightened at the will of others. My courage always rises with every attempt to intimidate me. I shall not say you are mistaken, because you could not really believe me to entertain any notion of alarming you. I have had the pleasure of your acquaintance long enough to know that you occasionally take great delight in professing opinions which, in fact, are not your own. Your cousin will paint a very pretty notion of me, Colonel, and teach you not to believe a word I say. Indeed, Mr. Darcy, it is very ungenerous in you to mention all that you knew to my disadvantage while you were in Hertfordshire. You shall force me to retaliate, and such things may come out as will shock your relations to hear. I am not afraid oh. of you. Pray let me hear what you have to accuse him of. I should like to know how he behaves among strangers. Very well, but prepare yourself for something very dreadful. My first time of ever seeing him at a ball, what do you think he did? He danced only one dance, though more than one young lady, to my certain knowledge, was sitting down in want of a partner. Perhaps I should have judged better and sought an introduction, but I am ill qualified to recommend myself to strangers. Shall we ask your cousin why a man of sense and education who has lived in the world is ill qualified to recommend himself to strangers? Well, I can answer you that. It's because he will not give himself the trouble. I certainly have not the talent which some possess of being able to converse easily with those I have never seen before. I cannot catch the tone of their conversation or appear interested in their concerns as I have often seen done. 
My fingers do not move over the instrument in the masterly manner which I have seen many women's do, but I always supposed it to be my own fault because I would not take the trouble of practicing. You are quite right. You have employed your time much better. But no one admitted to the privilege of hearing you can think anything wanting. What are you saying, Darcy? <laughs> of music again, madam. Miss Bennet does have a good notion of fingering, though her taste is not equal to Anne's. <laughs> I am confident that she would have been a delightful performer had her health allowed her to learn. <laughs> Alas! Elizabeth was sitting by herself the next morning writing to Jane, while Mr. Collins was on business in the village and Mrs. Collins in the house, when she was startled by a visitor, Mr. Darcy, and Mr. Darcy only. He seemed astonished too on finding her alone. Miss Bennet, in vain have I struggled. It will not do. My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. <laughs> I can well understand your own ast astonishment at this declaration, for I am amazed at myself. <laughs> my feelings for you have taken hold of me against my will, my reason, and almost against my character. Sir. Understand me, I beg you. For yourself alone, my admiration is only too natural. I share it with everyone who has the happiness of knowing you. But pardon me, for it pains me to offend you. The defects of your nearest relations, the total lack of propriety so frequently betrayed by your family, has so opposed my judgments to my inclination that it has required the utmost force of passion on my part to put them aside. But my dear Miss Bennet, your triumph is complete. Your own loveliness stands out the fairer in contrast to your surroundings. And I now hope that the strength of my love may have its reward in your acceptance. Mr. Darcy, in such cases as this, I believe it is the established mode to express a sense of obligation for the sentiments avowed, however unequally they may be returned. If I could now feel gratitude, I would thank you, but I cannot. I have never desired your good opinion, and you've certainly bestowed it most unwillingly. And this is all the reply to which I have the honor of expecting. I might wish to be informed why with so little attempt at civility I am thus rejected, but it is of small importance. I might as well inquire why with so evident a design at insulting me you chose to tell me you liked me against your will, your reason, and even your character. Was not this some cause for incivility if I was uncivil? I very clearly explained that the objections which appealed to my reason applied entirely to your family, and in, in, in no respect to yourself. I am a part of my family, Mr. Darcy. And allow me to say, since we have the opportunity of comparing my relations with your own, the contrast is not so marked as I had been led to suppose. But aside from all questions of either feeling or family, do you think any consideration would tempt me to accept the man who's been the means of ruining, perhaps forever, the happiness of a most beloved sister and involving her in misery of the acutest kind? Can you deny that you have done this? I have no wish of denying that I did everything in my power to separate my friend from your sister. I did not, indeed, anticipate involving either of them in misery of any kind. On your sister's side, at least, I was never able to discover any symptoms of peculiar regard for Mr. Bingley. For every reason, I must rejoice in my success with my friend. Toward him, I have been kinder than toward myself. Your arrogance in calmly deciding the extent of other people's sentiments does not surprise me. It is a piece of your whole nature. But your interference in my sister's concern is not all. Long before it had taken place, my opinion of you was decided. Your character was unfolded to me in the recital which I received months ago from Mr. Wickham. What can you have to say on the subject? 
In what imaginary act of friendship can you here defend yourself? You take an eager interest in that gentleman. Who that knows what his misfortunes have been can help feel his an misfortunes, yes, his misfortunes have been great indeed. Friend of your infliction, you have reduced him to this present state of poverty, comparative poverty. You've withheld the advantages which you must know to have been designed for him. You have done all this, and yet you can treat the mentions of his misfortunes with contempt and ridicule. And this is your opinion of me. This is the estimation in which you hold me. I thank you for explaining it so fully. Perhaps if I were to divulge the truth regarding Mr. Wickham, I might give you as great a surprise as you have given me. I do not care to go into the particulars, but in justice to myself, I feel as though I must tell you that the man whom you consider a martyr is a profligate with the most vicious propensities. A man who should never have entered your home, for his presence there is a continual source of danger. Mr. Darcy! I am ready at all times to give you the full proofs of all I have said, Miss Bennet, whenever you may so desire. Although I would gladly forget all the miserable circumstances myself, and no obligation less than the present should induce me to unfold them to any human being. Your judgment in the matter of my sister's happiness has given me a gauge by which I can measure your fairness to a man who has been so unfortunate as to offend you. My faith in Mr. Wickham is unshaken. I shall take what you have said, Miss Bennet, as a reflection on my judgment alone. Otherwise, my veracity would be at stake, and this I am sure you did not intend. Indeed, I understand your position perfectly. I have erred in the manner of my declaration. It is my own fault. I have wounded your pride. Your bitter accusations might have been suppressed had I concealed my struggles. I should have led you to believe that I was impelled by reason, by reflection, by inclination, by everything. But disguise of every sort is my abhorrence. Could you expect me to rejoice in the inferiority of your connections? Can you expect me to rejoice in your proposal that I ally myself to the conceit and impertinence of yours? No, Mr. Darcy. The manner of your declaration has affected me only in one way. It has spared me the concern which I might otherwise have felt in refusing you had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike way. You could not, however, have made me the offer of your hand in any possible way that would tempt me to accept it. From the very beginning, from the first moment I was impressed with the fullest belief of your arrogance, your conceit, and your selfish disdain for the feelings of others. I had not known you a month before I determined you were the last man in the world whom I could ever be prevailed upon to marry. You have said quite enough, madam. I perfectly comprehend your feelings and have now only to be ashamed of what mine have been. Forgive me for having taken up so much of your time and accept my best wishes for your health and happiness. Excuse me, miss. Either letter expresses for it. for me? Yes, miss. Well, it's from Jane. What can ever be the matter? Dearest Lizzie, I have bad news for you, and it cannot be delayed. An express came to us last night from Colonel Forster. He told us that Lydia had run away from Brighton with one of his officers. To own the truth, with Wickham. He first thought they had gone to Scotland, but... Oh, Lizzie, it is far worse than that. We now know that Wickham never intended to go there, or to marry her at all. Colonel Forster has been here today. He says that Wickham is not a man to be trusted. He left Brighton terribly in debt, and his record is bad in every way. Oh, Lizzie, our distress is very great. Father is going to London with Colonel Forster instantly to try to discover the fugitives. It is hard to ask you to shoot to me. Lydia! Place, Wickham! Oh, I must go! No, I must send someone for a carriage. Oh, Colonel Forster! Oh, Colonel, would you, would you go for the carriage the or the Bennett? express? I have just had bad news from home. Uh, the express, or can you get me a carriage? Would you be so kind? Miss Bennet, what is the matter? Miss Bennet has just received bad news from home. She wishes to return to Zyza's carriage. Go for the carriage, Fitzwilliam. Get from the, from the stables. Go. I will stay with Miss Bennet. Shall I call the maid, Miss Bennet? A glass of water. Shall I fetch one for you? You are very ill. No. No, there is nothing the matter with me. I'm quite well. I, I've just received some dreadful news from Longbourn. I'm sorry to hear it. I've just had a letter from Jane with such dreadful news. It cannot be concealed from anyone. I'm grieved, Miss Bennet. Grieved on your behalf. Mr. Darcy, you are right. 
If only I had believed you and others, but I could not believe it. What is it, Miss Bennet? What has happened? I cannot tell it, and yet everyone must know soon enough. My sister Lydia has eloped, has thrown herself into the power of Mr. Wickham. She has no money, nothing that could tempt him to... She is lost forever. Good heavens, Miss Bennet, your sister and... This is my fault. I should have realized the danger. I should have spoken. My own wretched experience with the man should have been told. Your experience? Yes. I, I should long ago have spoken boldly. What do you mean? Mr. Wickham attempted the same plan with my own sister two years ago. She was an ignorant, innocent, trusting girl of 15. Happily, his villainy was discovered and prevented, but I should have spoken. Had his character been known, this could not have happened. You tried to warn me, Mr. Darcy. Everyone tried to tell me, but I could not believe it. And now it is too late. It is too late. Let us hope not. Is what you have told me certain, absolutely certain? Yes, they left Brighton together on Sunday night. And what has been done, or at least attempted, to recover your sister? My father has gone to London. He, he will beg Uncle Gardner's assistance. But I know nothing can be done. I know very well nothing can be done. How is such a man to be worked on? How are they to be discovered? I have not the smallest hope, but it's all horrible. Miss Bennet, I have made a wretched mistake in all this. Would to heaven that something could be said or done on my part that might make reparation or offer consolation to such distress. Darcy spoke no more. He was walking up and down in earnest meditation, his brow contracted, his air gloomy. Elizabeth soon observed and instantly understood it as revealing a facet of his character which she had not seen before this moment. Mama, try to take some of this food. You will be ill if you do not eat something. How can I eat when I am ill? It is all very well for the rest of you now that this disgrace has been brought upon me. But if I had been able to carry my point, if I could have gone to Brighton with all my family, this would never have happened. But poor dear Lydia had nobody to take care of her. Oh, that villainous Wickham! I am sure there must have been some great neglect or other somewhere, for Lydia is not the sort of girl to run away with a man. <sighs> but no one would listen to me. I was overruled as I always am. <sighs> poor dear Lydia. Poor child. Mama, try to be calm. Oh, how can I help being excited? You have no feelings. Here is Mr. Bennet gone away, and I know he will fight that abominable Wickham and be killed. <laughs> and then what is to become of us? The Collinses will turn us out before Mr. Bennet is cold in his grave. Mama, do not have such fantastic ideas. If my brother, your Uncle Gardner, is not kind to us, I do not know what we shall do. Uncle Gardner is doing everything in his power for us. Perhaps he will be able to find Lydia and arrange a marriage after all. We must not give up hope. Yes, that is true, Jane. My brother may be able to see that they are married. Write to him, Jane. Tell him to find them out wherever they may be. And if they are not married already, to make them marry. And as for the wedding clothes, tell them not to wait for that, but tell Lydia she shall have as much money to buy them after they are married. And above all things, keep Mr. Bennet from fighting. Tell him what a dreadful state I'm in, and tell Lydia to give no directions about her clothes until she has seen me, for she does not know the best warehouses. Where are you going? Why, to write the letter, Mama. Oh, not now, Jane. Don't leave me here alone. Where is Lizzie? She's gone down the road to meet the post. She hopes to bring you good news. Well, she'd better stay here and be of some help. She only just got back, and now she leaves me. But nobody thinks of me. Nobody knows what I suffer. I'm almost out of my wits and have such tremblings and flutterings all over me. Such spasms in my side and pains in my head and beatings at heart that I can get no rest by night or day. Good news! Lizzie! Lizzie! Lizzie. Mama, they are married! Oh. <laughs> Lizzie, are you sure? Don't excite me, are you oh, sure? Yes, to certain Aunt Gardner has just written me all about it. They really are married. Oh, Jane! Lizzie, my dear, dear Lydia, she is really married. I shall see her again. Oh, my dear kind brother. But how did it happen, Lizzie? Yes, tell us about it. May I read the letter? No, I will tell you all. Well, first father and uncle succeeded in finding Lydia. Aunt Gardner does not tell me just how it was done. And your father found that they were married after all. I told him No, that... Mama. They were not married and had no idea of being. 
but father and uncle insisted upon it. They took Lydia at once to her aunt's house, and from there they were married only yesterday at St. Clement's Church. St. Clement's a fine church. Fine church. Father has arranged to have all Wickham's debts paid, and he is to settle an allowance on Lydia. Where are they? What are they going to do? Well, Father is coming home at once. At first he would not let Lydia and Wickham come to us, but Aunt and Uncle urged it, and Father knew how anxious Mama would be, and so they are coming here too. At once? Yes, directly today. Oh, my dear, dear Lydia, how I long to see her. And my dear Mr. Wickham too. <laughs> but the wedding clothes! I must write to my sister Gardner about them directly. Mama, there is plenty of time for that. Oh, well, perhaps you're right. Oh, my dear, dear Lydia, she is really married. I, I am so happy. She is Mrs. Wickham. Oh, how well it sounds. Oh, but my dear Jane, I must write to, to my sister about the clothes. We will settle with your father about the money later. Oh, I am in such a flutter. And, oh, but here comes Kitty and Mary. Girls, Lydia is getting married and is coming home directly. Married? To Wickham? Wonderful. Oh, Kitty. It will be good to see her safely home. Yes, you shall all have a bowl of punch to make merry for her wedding. Now I am going inside to write about the clothes. Jane, you stay here and wait for your father. Come, girls, think of it, Mrs. Wickham. <laughs> oh, Lizzie, how relieved and happy we should be. Is it not wonderful? Are you sure it is true? Have you told us all? Yes, Jane, it is true. They are really married. And for this we are to be thankful. In spite of Lydia's folly and Wickham's wretched character, we are to rejoice how strange it all is. May I not read the letter, Lizzie? No, no, not now, dear Jane. Aunt Gardner has some very odd notions in her head about how it all came to pass. Later, perhaps. I am very sorry that in my agitation I told Mr. Darcy about this whole wretched affair. Now that it has come out so well, he need never have known anything about it. But how would you have explained things to Charlotte and Mr. Collins without his help? Oh. From what you have told me, Mr. Darcy made everything so smooth and plausible for your sudden departure. Yes, that is true. Really, Lizzie, I think I shall have to take up the cudgels in Mr. Darcy's defense. His kindness to you has quite won my heart. And his amazing proposal was certainly a most flattering compliment. Why can you see no good in Mr. Darcy, Lizzie? You were always so full of excuses for Wickham, although it is true that his open and delightful manners deceived us all. Yes, there certainly was some great mismanagement in the education of those two young men. One has all the goodness and the other all the appearance of it. I never thought Mr. Darcy so deficient in the appearance of it as you did. And besides, he couldn't possibly have had the friends he has if he didn't possess some good qualities. Lizzie, did you hear that Mr. Bingley is back at Netherfield? Jane, no, when did he come? Have you seen him? No, I hardly expect to see him. Jane, yes, you will. If he has returned, it can be only for one thing. I understand, you're going to be very happy. No, Lizzie, don't. That is all over now, and besides, I don't want to be happy unless you can be too. Oh, 40 Bingleys couldn't make me happy. Till I have your disposition, I can never have your happiness. No, let me shift for myself. Perhaps if I have very good luck, I may meet with another Mr. Collins in time. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bennett has returned, ladies, and he's looking for you. Oh, Papa, Papa returned. Oh, Papa, tell us all about it. Are quickly, they really very quickly? Papa? Yes, yes, that uh, misfortune is well settled upon them. They are married fast enough. When will they be here? Oh, they shall be here directly. I didn't care to travel with them. They're not too far behind. Only far enough to keep out of the dust of my carriage. Oh, dear Papa, how you must have suffered. I'll say nothing of that. Who should suffer but myself? It is my own doing, and I ought to feel it. You must not be too severe upon yourself. Oh, you may warn me against such an evil. Human nature is so prone to fall into it. No, Lizzie. Allow me for once in my life to feel how much I have been to blame. I'm not afraid to be overpowered by its impression. It will pass away soon enough. But, Papa, how did you persuade them to marry? I didn't persuade them. I, I haven't the means. It is all your uncle's doing. He has managed to buy Wickham for us. You're a good uncle. Yes. There are two things that I would very much like to know. One is how much money your uncle has laid down to bring this about. And two, 
How am I ever to pay him? You mean uncle did not do it all? No, uh, Papa, Aunt Gardner has written to tell me that you are to give Lydia an allowance. <laughs> yes, yes, one hundred a year. Do you think that any man in his proper senses would marry Lydia on so slight a temptation as one hundred a year? That is very true. Well, then it must be Uncle Gardner's doing, <sighs> generous man. Oh, I'm afraid he's distressed himself. A small sum could not do all this. No. No, Wickham's a fool if he took Lydia for a farthing less than ten thousand pounds. You know, I, I should feel so sorry to think of him in this way. In the very beginning of our relationship. Ten thousand pounds. How is one half such a sum to be repaid? That is what I would like to know. Well, uncle's kindness can never be requited. If such goodness as this does not make Lydia miserable, she will never deserve to be happy. Mm. I hear voices. Oh, this uh, house. This I happening. shall accept their congratulations later when I have rested. You know, Lizzie, I am prodigiously fond of Wickham. I defy even Sir William Lucas to produce a more valuable son-in-law. I must tell Mama. Ah, well, Jane, Lizzie, here we are. My sister Jane, my sister Elizabeth. Good gracious, here I am again. I'm sure I had no idea of being married when I went away. Though I thought it would be good fun if I was. Wickham. Have you seen my pink flowered band box? No, it isn't here. Oh, Wickham, do go fetch it. You know, tis the one with the white satin hat you bought me. I wouldn't lose it for the world. Go, go. Certainly, my dear. You see how eagerly I embrace my new opportunities. La, I'm so tired, but I'm dying to give you an account of my wedding. I think there cannot be too little said on that subject. You are so strange, Lizzie. But Jane wants to hear I know, and anyway, I want to tell you. <laughs> well, there was such a fuss. My aunt was preaching and talking away to me all the time I was dressing, just as though she was reading a sermon. But I didn't hear one word of ten of it all. I was thinking of my dear Mr. Wickham. <laughs> I longed to know whether he would be married in his blue coat. Well, then we got to the church, and then after we got there, my uncle gave me such a fright because he was so late, and he was to give me away, you know, but then again, if he hadn't come, Darcy would have done as well. Mr. Darcy? Oh, yes, Darcy was there. He was the one who brought Wickham. But gracious me, I quite forgot I ought not to have said a word about it. I promised them as faithfully. Oh, what will Wickham say? It was to be kept a secret. If it was to be a secret, Lydia, say not another word on the subject. We shall ask you no questions. Thank you, for if you did, I should certainly tell all. And then Wickham would be angry with me. Oh, but where is Mama? Oh, Mama! Aren't you so glad to see us? Do all the people hereabouts know that I am married? I was afraid they might not, and so I let my hand rest on the window frame outside of the carriage so that everyone could see my wedding ring. And then I bowed and smiled like everything. Oh, you may be sure that everybody will rejoice with us in our good luck. Your marriage is a great compensation to me after all my disappointment about Jane and Lizzie. I do not blame Jane, for she would have got Mr. Bingley if she could, but Lizzie. Oh, Lydia, it is very hard to think that she might now be Mrs. Collins. <laughs> but how about your clothes? Oh, you needn't worry about that. I have a lot already. But you didn't know the best warehouse is. Well, never mind. We will see to that later. Now, you must all come in and have dinner. You must be famished. Come, girls. Come, Mr. Wickham. Uh, Jane, I take your place now. <laughs> I go first because I... I'm a married woman. <laughs> One morning, about a week after the arrival of the Wickhams to Longbourn, a chaise and four drove up the lawn. It was too early in the morning for visitors, and this chaise did not answer to that of any of the neighbours. The door was thrown open, and their visitor entered. The lady cat. 
Catherine de Bourgh. I hope you are well, Miss Bennet. That lady, I suppose, is your mother. Yes, she is, madam. Yes, madam. And that, I suppose, is one of your sisters. Well, yes, this is my youngest daughter but one. My youngest of all is lately married. And my eldest is somewhere about the grounds. This is a most inconvenient sitting room for the evening in summer. The windows are full west. We never sit here after dinner for that very reason. <laughs> Would you like to take some refreshment? I came here to talk to Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Why, to be sure. <laughs> Come, Kitty. You can be at no loss, Miss Bennet, to understand the reason of my coming hither. Your own heart, your own conscience must tell you why I come. Indeed, you are mistaken, madam. I have not at all been able to account for the honor of seeing you here. Miss Bennet, you ought to know that I am not one to be trifled with, but however insincere you may choose to be, you shall not find me so. I have been told that you, that Miss Elizabeth Bennet, would in all likelihood be soon married to my nephew, Mr. Darcy. Though I knew this to be a scandalous falsehood, I instantly resolved on setting off for this place that I might make my sentiments known to you. If you believed it impossible to be true, I wonder that you took the trouble of coming so far. What could your ladyship propose by I want to insist upon having such a report universally contradicted. Your coming to Longbourn to see me and my family would rather be a confirmation of it, if indeed such a report is in if, existence. Do you then pretend to be ignorant of it? Do not you know that it is bread above? I never heard it was. And can you likewise declare that there is no foundation for it? I do not pretend to possess equal frankness with your ladyship. You may ask questions which I shall choose not to answer. This is not to be borne. Miss Bennet, I insist upon being satisfied. Has, he, has my nephew made you an offer of marriage? Your ladyship has declared it to be impossible. It ought to be so. But your arts and allurements may have made him forget what he owes to himself and his family. You may have drawn him in. If I have, I shall be the last person to confess Miss it. Miss Bennet, do you know who I am? I am not accustomed to such language. It's... I am Mr. Darcy's own aunt, and I am entitled to know his dearest concern. But you are not entitled to know mine. Let me be rightly understood. This match can never take place. No. Never. Mr. Darcy is engaged to my daughter. Now what have you got to say? Only this, that if he is so, you can have no reason to suppose he would make an offer to me. The engagement between them is of a peculiar kind. While in their cradles, my sister and I planned their union. Have you no regard for the wishes of his friends? Do not, you see, that honor, decorum, nay, interest, forbid you marrying my nephew. Yes, interest, Miss Bennet, for you will be slighted and despised by everyone connected with him. These are heavy misfortunes, but the wife of Mr. Darcy must have such extraordinary sources Obstant. of happiness she could have no cause to repine. Headstrong girl, tell me once for all, are you engaged to my nephew? I'm not. And will you promise me never to enter into such an engagement? I will make no promise of the kind. Miss Spent, I am shocked and astonished. I shall not go away until you have given me the assurance I require. And I certainly never shall give it. I must beg, therefore, to be importuned on this subject no further. Not so hasty, if you please. I had hoped to spare you this final humiliation, but your insolence forbids it. I'm no stranger to the particulars of your sister's infamous elopement. 
I know all. The young man's marrying her was a patched up business at the expense of my nephew. Oh, you needn't start, miss. Nobody knows the whole affair better than you. Yet I don't wonder you blush to find yourself so discovered. Uh, Madam, my I... nephew must have spent full five or six thousand pounds to save your family from disgrace. I should think that such generosity might appeal a little to your gratitude and sense of decency. Madam, I it is quite to... useless to protest. I have the facts from the best authority. And yet, such a scandal is not enough. You wish to make this shameless girl my nephew's sister and the son of his father's steward, his brother. Heaven and earth are the shades of Pemberley to be thus polluted. Madam, you have insulted me in every manner possible. I must beg you go. This is beyond endurance. Selfish girl, you are resolved then to have him. I have said nothing of the kind. I am only resolved to act in that manner that will, in my opinion, constitute my happiness without any reference to you or any other person so wholly unconnected with me. This is your final resolve? Very well. I shall now know how to act. Do not imagine, Miss Bennet, that your ambition will ever be gratified. I would hoped to find you reasonable, but depend upon it, I shall carry my point. I take no leave of you, Miss Bennet. I send no compliments to your mother. You deserve no such attention. I am most seriously displeased. The discomposure of spirits which this extraordinary visit threw Elizabeth into could not be easily overcome, nor could she learn to think of it less incessantly. So she went to seek her elder sister in the garden. Jane, Jane, Lady Catherine has been here. Lady Catherine? Here? Yes, Jane, and she says it was Darcy that paid all that money to Wickham. It was Darcy that saved us, and she said that I persuaded him, that I ensnared him. But that's impossible. It was our no, uncle. No, Jane. No, no, I can put things together now. Aunt Gardner hints about it in that letter, and then what Lydia let fall in her fear of Wickham's anger. Lizzie, dear. Mr. Darcy's motives are clear enough, and that should give you no pain. No, you are mistaken. I know his motives. He, he feels as though he were responsible because he was silent about Wickham's true character. He said all this never would have happened if he had done his duty. And now he will despise us. Two gentlemen from Netherfield, miss. Oh, I told them they would find you here. Oh, Jane, I cannot see them. Oh. Miss Bennet. I'm so happy to see you again. Miss Elizabeth, it is good indeed to be back at Longbourn. Miss Bennet, believe me, I should not have followed my friend. I only meant to ride with him to the lodge, but I met my aunt coming away from here, and from something she said, I feared she might have offended you. Miss Bennet, will you do me the honor of showing me the hermitage? We'll be back directly. Forgive my intrusion. I will go. No. No, please stay, Mr. Darcy. Excuse my own incivility. Your aunt's visit excited me. I, I shall be myself in a moment. Mr. Darcy, you must allow me to thank you for your unexampled kindness to my poor sister. I'm sorry. Exceedingly sorry that you have ever been informed of it. How can I ever beg your pardon? It is far better that we know the truth, Mr. Darcy. For my own part, I can never express to you our obligation. The, obli Ms. Bennett, the obligation was entirely my own. You remember I told you had I spoken, this never would have happened. Yes, yes, I recall, but you exaggerated your responsibility. I, we, of course my father will see you about your loan to us. I, I would not have Lady Catherine I think that we did I will settle matters not... with Lady Catherine, Miss Bennett. Have no fears on that score. She shall be set right, I assure you. Thank you, and for all your trouble, your kindness, my, my family can never repay you. If you will thank me, let it be for yourself alone. That the wish of giving happiness to you might add force to the other inducements which led me on, I shall not attempt to deny. 
but your family owes me nothing. Much as I respect them, I believe I thought only of you. I know not what to say. You are too generous to trifle with me. If your feelings are still what they were, tell me so at once. My affections and wishes are unchanged. But one word from you will silence me on this matter forever. Do not remind me what I once said to you. What did you say of me that I did not deserve? My behavior to you at the time was unpardonable. I can hardly think of it without abhorrence. Your reproof I shall never forget. Had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike manner, you know not how these words have tortured me. I never had the smallest idea of them being taken in such a way. I can easily believe it. You thought me devoid of every proper feeling. The turn of your countenance I shall never forget. You said that I could not have addressed you in any possible way that would have tempted you to accept me. Elizabeth, I confess I have been a selfish being my whole life. As a child, I was given good principles, but I was left to follow them in pride and conceit. Such I might still have been, but for you. My feelings, my feelings are, I'm ashamed to remember what I said then. My feelings are so different now. In fact, they are quite the opposite. Dearest, loveliest Elizabeth. They walked on without knowing in what direction. There was too much to be thought and felt and said for attention to any other objects. Thank you.